Very good. Great. All right. Good mm -hmm. evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to see everyone here. I hope you're all as excited as I am about this presentation. Um, it, it, I know Melissa just said it, but it does uh, bear repeating to just please double check right now. It doesn't hurt to double check that you're on mute so we don't get any background noise, please. Um, so with that, it is my mm. absolute pleasure to introduce this evening, David Newsom as our speaker. David is based in LA and he's a 30 year veteran of film and TV. In 2018, after having the wonderful experience of watching his own sterile urban yard spring to life after, after giving it a little love and replacing it with native plants, he, uh, he founded the Wild Yards Project. He draws on his past experience as a storyteller and a photographer to spread awareness of the native habitat movement using social media, education, community gardens, and consultation to help retrofit biodiverse habitat into urban and suburban spaces. David is also a father of two wild ones of his own, and he says he created the Wild Yards Project because his plants insisted. I absolutely love that. I imagine some of us, uh, or many of us here tonight can really appreciate that sentiment and have also experienced that same joy and inspiration that comes from a native habitat garden. And so with that, I'm incredibly excited to hear more about your efforts, David, and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Uh, it's really fun to almost be in San Luis Obispo. Um, I love San Luis Obispo. And uh, next time I'll come really uh, just for no reason at all. I'll just come bring the family up and we'll hang out because <clears throat> I love it up there. Um, and thank you, Melissa. Um, the, you know, the plants tell us there's a Jeremy Narby is an ethnobotanist who wrote about uh, a book called The Cosmic Serpent about ayahuasca and the Shipibo Indians. And he got into this big debate, a big scientific debate, because when he spoke to the Shipibo Indians, he was trying to understand how they could create ayahuasca. I don't know why I'm telling you all this now, and you probably already know it. Um, but because it comes from a vine, which is high up in the, in the canopy, and then a, a leaf or a root, that's that. Anyway, the two elements are very far apart. And he said, how would, you know, the odds of just you know, numerically of, of putting all these plants together to get something that created such a powerful entheogen or, you know, a billion to one. And so he said how, he asked them how they came up with this cocktail. And they said, the plants tell us. And <clears throat> of course, all of his peers rejected that. But I think uh, a little farther down the line, I think most of us know that the plants are desperately trying to tell us a lot of things. And, uh, you know, it's if if and how we're listening, I guess, is the conversation. Um, anyway, <clears throat> I like this opening salvo. This is Thomas Rainier, who's a new perennialist, um, you know, in the in the vein of Pete Udolph. I'm sure all of you know him. Um, uh, and I don't agree with a lot of his plant choices. But I love this line that the next renaissance of human culture will be the reconstruction of our natural world in our cities plants will be at the center of it all. I think that's just an incredibly powerful idea. And for me, this talk is really, it's, it's not so much about botany or horticulture, uh, although it is at its essence, precisely about that. But really what it's about is how we move into the 21st century and what, what design decisions, what intentional recreation of the natural world can we invoke and make it scalable and adaptable and uh, relevant and available to everyone. You know, that's, that's what kind of makes me really interested. That's why I started doing this when I started gardening. Uh, and I'll tell you that story. Um, I, I wanted everyone to know about it. And so that's what this story is. This is about, you know, how do we move forward? And what is something we can do that gives us power and gives us agency? Um, in the face of what's coming. And I think we all know what's coming, we're living in it. So um, here we go. What are we doing to our children versus what are we doing for our children? So London just released a study, a global study that found young people are suffering profound, profound psychological distress due to climate change. 
Um, some 45% of 10,000 young people surveyed across 10 countries um, said anxiety and distress over the climate crisis was affecting their daily life and their ability to function. And three quarters of the respondents aged 16 to 25 felt that the future is frightening. I have kids. 64% of young people said that governments were not doing enough to avoid climate crisis. This article that we're looking at uh, is in the Washington Post magazine. And what I like about this article is it suggests that a huge factor in depression is how we, as parents and as older people, as the older generation, talk about this. And what do we give, uh, how do we give our kids a sense of agency and possibility and inspire all of us to arm ourselves and our children with ideas and skill sets that build resilience that defeat hopelessness and actually transform the way we are on earth. And that's what gets me out of bed. That and my son who always gets up before me. So inciting incident, we'll shoot back to New Jersey, uh, late 60s, I'm a kid. I live in one of these many ranch house, sprawling ranch house developments that's right up against a hurricane fence and beyond that tertiary secondary woods, dilapidated farmland. Um, you know, the whole post-war boom just ripping through the east. And, but when I jump over that hurricane fence and I land in that secondary or tertiary forest and explore those old dilapidated barns, I have access to a lot of wildlife. The baseline experience that I had as a kid in the New Jersey suburbs shaped who I am. And, um, uh, you know, the, under, the, under this dense canopy of, of oaks and maples and elms, it, I had all kinds of things. This eastern box turtle was my, this was my prize. This was my, uh, you know, my holy grail when I'd go out on expeditions, but I'd also find marble salamanders, tiger salamanders, pickerel frogs in little streams, tree frogs, little brown bats, the occasional deer. There's actually way more deer in New Jersey now than there were when I was a boy. And, uh, you know, that's all gone now. That's all been buried under development, but it created in me a very powerful baseline and expectation for the natural world. Many decades later, after a move to Los Angeles and a long career in film and television, I met my wife, Sean Hader. Um, we got married. We bought a house. Uh, we got, well, I buried the punchline. We got married and, of course, pregnant and without a house. We found a home here in Northeast LA, uh, not the, within two years, we got these two guys and I'm starting to become obsessed with what their world is going to be like. Yeah, we live right up against the Mediterranean Chaparral here, which is a stunning, beautiful gem that I feel fortunate enough to have transplanted myself at the base of. But where we live, uh, it's just a busy street in the middle of a busy city. There's not a lot of wildlife to be found. And uh, this was my backyard when we moved in and cleared away a bunch of dead trees and some garbage. Um, I preface what I'm about to say by saying I'm lucky enough to have a backyard. I'm hyper aware of that. But given that, uh, that proximity, there's our house and there's our bank parking lot. What about my kids' box turtles? I, I became very obsessed with what their experience of the natural world was going to be. Um, I was worried that they'd have no baseline sense of the natural world, no baseline interaction with a, a meaningful sense of nature and therefore love for nature. Um, so I started doing some homework and uh, I started learning as we were talking about a lawn, and I know you all know the basic st stats about lawns, but we'll just rip through them really fast to refresh our brains. 40 million acres of lawn in the US and more every day. They consume up to 10 billion gallons of fresh water daily. They use 80 million pounds of pesticides a year, 90 million pounds of fertilizers. They're responsible for 5% of our carbon emissions, thanks to lawn mowers and leaf blowers. And a really fun fact that came from a UC Davis study, the average American child here in Los Angeles, where we have four easily accessible outdoor seasons, they use their lawn an aggregate of 40 minutes a week, adults use it 10 minutes. So that got me thinking. And uh, I started with a pollinator garden. I think that's everyone's gateway drug to gardening if you're interested in wildlife. I went to the local um, 
commercial store and I bought a lot of non-native plants that uh, were all in the pollinator section. section. And, um, and it did what it had to do. I was hooked, you know, my daughter was born and uh, within, within months we had all kinds of butterflies and things in the yard. But um, one of the things I noticed is that I was only seeing honeybees for the most part. I wasn't, the more I started to learn about the wildlife of the region, I realized my palate, my menu of wildlife was pretty narrow. And so that's when a friend of mine was like, oh, dude, you're not going to become a native plant nerd, are you? And I was like, what's a native plant nerd? And now I'm a native plant nerd. So I went down, I took a deep dive, and I started studying, reading different people, trying to get my brain around what it even meant to create habitat. It was completely new to me. I didn't know a thing. Um, I truly knew nothing. I'd been in the film and television business my whole life. I knew that I liked nature. I was a longtime hiker and backpacker, but I knew nothing about the very specific and beautiful taxonomy of the, you know, the coastal sage scrub. Uh, but just real quick, a couple of people who made a big uh, difference in the way I thought about things. One is uh, David Quammen, a famous naturalist writer and science writer. He wrote an article called Planet of Weeds for Harper's Magazine. And it was about the way in which weeds were advancing upon the landscape and the impact that was going to have on all our lives. Um, and then I learned about the, of course, the National Wildlife Federation Certified Wildlife Habitat Program. I thought that's cool. It's something I could shoot for. And then I met Doug Talme. Uh, he gave a talk here in town and Doug's ability to take actual data, to apply his data in the very entertaining and powerful way that he did was for me a call to action. I finally understood that this wasn't just some arbitrary aesthetic uh, decision, that this had a, a basis in science and that a, a highly achievable, almost immediately achievable result could be had through a thoughtful application of native plants for amplifying biodiversity. Carol Bornstein, who now is one of my advisors on the Wild Yards Project, has written many seminal books on California native plants, as you all know. And Nick Hummingbird, who is a cultural educator and native plantsman, um, who's working with me on a couple gardens, opened my eyes to a, a great many things about the indigenous history of California, the relationship between people and plants. And uh, so I owe him a great deal uh, for my understanding of California native plant culture. Um, the main idea that all this boils down to is reconciliation ecology, which begins at home. Reconciliation ecology was the driving idea between, behind Doug Talmay's study. It is the science of inventing, establishing, and maintaining new habitats to conserve species diversity in places where people live, work, and play. And that idea that nature starts at home is a very powerful idea. It's a very powerful idea. I certainly grew up with this whole idea, the romanticism of the Sierras. I lived in New York City and I'd read about the Sierras. Nature was always out there. I'd get in my car and I'd drive to it. I never took responsibility for understanding that nature, the possibility of biodiversity, the possibility of just even just a relationship with nature was available right now. Uh, that was Dr. Michael Rosenzweig. Reconciliation ecology is his term. We created it in 2002. Um, he also had he also released the data that basically there's only four percent uncorrupted wild space left in the U.S. The other 96 percent has been disturbed, lost to city, suburbs, farmland, timber, grazing. Um, so there you go. That was sort of like the, the, the that was like my more that big ball of information that I started to uh, kind of get a. Uh, a trajectory from that kind of propelled me forward. So, oh, uh, okay. So 90% of all leaf eating insects rely on, native, rely on native plants for food. An average nesting pair of birds consumes between 6,000, 9,000 caterpillars per clutch. This is uh, all data from Doug Talamay's study that he did in New England. Um, <clears throat> Habitat loss drives catastrophic animal declines. We've lost 3 billion birds since 1970. That's the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. 40% of all insects globally in decline. That's Biological Conservation Journal 
April of 2019. This is all what we're facing in the face of this understanding of how plants and the creation of habitat can amplify biodiversity where you live. Where we live, California coastal sage scrub. <clears throat> Real quick, we, I'm not gonna hang out in here because to me, this idea is about all of us. It doesn't matter where we live, but of course we do live in a rare gem. This is a map of um, a, a taxonomy across, shared taxonomies across the United States. Uh, this was given to me, um, sorry, uh, by my friend who I'm just, I'm moving so fast, I'm forgetting his name, Isaac Brown at UCLA. So what's interesting to me is that a great, great, you know, from the Mississippi on east and, and even to the west a little bit, we've gotten a massive shared taxonomy enormous amount of biodiversity that shares a vast range and it gets a little more specific here but when you get out to California we're really on our own um, and that sense that we are completely alone out here with this gem and this very rare taxonomy of plants and animals um, is a very driving power for me it's a very driving force um, California is ranked first in the United States in mammal diversity, fourth in bird diversity, and fifth in reptile diversity. Um, it's also one of five top ranking states for number of animal species at risk. 40% um, of our plants are endemic. So we have a lot to offer and we have a lot to lose, um, which I think gives this mission even obviously greater urgency. Islands are where species go to die. This is a great quote by David Quammen um, in his book, Song of the Dodo. He was literally talking about islands, but it's a, it's a metaphor that applies. I think as we all know, this is fragmentation. So species declines in the US fall squarely at the feet of habitat loss, um, cutting up the breeding and feeding grounds of species, no matter how large they might seem to us is a surefire way to terminate the species for good. And over time, these lowered populations, they can't survive the natural turn downturns, disasters, fires, drought, et cetera, all of which impact us. Um, those things doom species to failure if they can't move about and find food, water, and mates. Um, obviously, uh, we've got, here we have the San Gabriels, we've got Debs Park over here, we've got Griffith Park, uh, getting ahead of myself, sorry. And in between that, we've got just vast seas of humanity, suburb upon suburb upon suburb, going over from Northeast Los Angeles and then heading out into the valley. Um, these, even the great charismatic megafauna simply can't make it across these spaces. Um, a really nice example of this, a fun example of this is I live in Eagle Rock, right up here we have Hill Street and above that we have the 134 highway before we hit the mountains, it dips into a little bit what's left of Glendale, La Cañada, and then you have the San Bernardinos, I mean, the San Gabriels. But we get a lot of bears just two blocks above my house. And the reason we get those bears is because they come down the Arroyo Seco. They come down and, uh, and they can't get back up. They hit the 134 freeway. And so they just wandered through people's yards. This one wandered for about two weeks, kind of bumping up along the 134 freeway until it found a way to go around the two back up into Glendale, this happens probably once a month. Uh, it's charming, but it's an indication of a problem. But fragmentation impacts everything. Longhorn bees need habitat too, and the vast majority of yards in the US here in California do not provide that habitat. The average flight range of our native bees vary, but most lack the range of non-native honeybees. And some of our more vital species can fly as little as 300 feet compared to honeybees range of six miles. So these are all, this is all fragmentation. They can't make it from here to here. There's no place for them to go for even the smallest amounts of habitat. <clears throat> so fragmentation happens block to block, house to house. First plant, first native bee. This is a longhorn summer bee tucking in on Cleveland sage. Cleveland sage was the first native plant that I planted in my yard. And uh, this beautiful thing showed up and I had my macro lens out and I was like, what? I, I knew it wasn't a honeybee, but I didn't know what it was. 
I also learned that native bees are wildly undervalued in our agricultural systems and then therefore in our gardens from the UCSG site. In almost all crops, native bees are the primary pollinator or they significantly supplement the activity of honeybees. Some native bees are specialists on the very plants we use for food, squashes, pumpkins, gourds, and the annual sunflowers. We're so, as everybody in this thread and this conversation knows, we're overversed in the plight of, of agriculturally used honeybees, and we're desperately under, underversed in the plight of our other 4,000 native bees here in the United States, all of which do the same amount of work and all of which get an enormous amount of short shrift when it comes to creating habitat and providing food sources. This is my front yard. Um, uh, this is my front yard now before, if we can go back, just to give you a little refresher, a little reminder, uh, that's what it was. Uh, and I, I, I failed to point out the beautiful flipper sod. Here's the thing to a realtor. If anybody's a realtor out there, if you're going to put down sod, water it. Just make it a little tip. That one's, that one's free. Um, we bought a house with a dead lawn. Uh, this is our lawn now. Uh, this is, uh, I'll go back and just, this is the, this was the backyard. This is um, our backyard now. Although this beautiful Cal mixed California fescue lawn, dead, 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 dead. Everything else is alive. Um, and I show you this because Obviously, this is native plants, but these are not natural settings. You wouldn't find this juxtaposition of these plants. And uh, some of my friends who are native plant landscapers give me a lot of um, crap about this. But one, I, it's a laboratory and I like doing it. And the other thing is that um, the greater plant diversity when you're using native plants, the greater amount of biodiversity you have. And I have uh, my, I've recorded in this front area, toeys, wrens, hummingbirds. Bush tits, digger bees, leaf cutter bees, carpenter bees, bumblebees, alligator lizards, western fence lizards, bush katydids, shorthorn grasshoppers, morning cloak butterflies, skippers, painted ladies, hair streaks, monarchs, and a peacock. And I'm pretty sure the garden had nothing to do with that. I have no idea why there was a peacock hanging out in our yard, uh, but it was awesome. Our backyard, same list, actually much greater. We get a lot of uh, we get a lot of different birds of prey that come through and train and teach their young in there as well as birds. And what I'm going to do is kind of just stop down and do some animal stories for a little bit because that was the thing that was the most powerful for me. Uh, that was the thing that really got me hooked was just the enormous amount of wildlife that showed up in our yard. So I. This rankles people when I say it, I say pollinator gardens are to habitat gardens as a froyo shop is to a village. Pollinator gardens are really important. And uh, I just trying to encourage people to think of a more holistic system. A pollinator garden can obviously be a habitat garden, but I think a lot of people as I did got very attracted to what is listed as pollinator plants in commercial shops. And those plants don't actually uh, necessarily help you amplify your habitat because habitat is about practices. But the amount of wildlife that showed up in my yard and why it showed up was really interesting to me. So obviously morning cloaks on the tansy leaf, the salia, really cool butterfly and a wonderful uh, hardy wildflower, spring wildflower. But this is red, this is a young red-shouldered hawk that learn to hunt in our yard. Uh, red tail, red-shouldered hawks are like red-tailed hawks. They're ground feeders. They're not aerial feeders like peregrines or, or Cooper's hawks. They generally feed on the ground. This young hawk um, landed on this. Uh, I was a plum tree that died. I cut it down. I laid it on its side, trimmed it up. Landed on that. It was about 18 inches off the ground. Looking around, I could not figure out for the life of me what this animal was doing. And then it jumped down and it started scratching in the dirt, uh, honestly, like a chicken. I mean, it just seemed like a chicken. And I called my friend Scott Logan over at Wild Wings Ecology and I was like, I've got a hawk 
that's scratching around in my garden like a chicken, what's it doing? And he said, it's trying to survive. 80% of all um, raptors die in the first year of their life. It turns out learning to hunt is incredibly hard. And so what this one was doing was scratching, just looking for beetles and worms and whatever it could do to get protein. And that possibility was because I didn't rake my leaf litter. I let my leaf litter lie. Fundamental early 101 rule of creating habitat is leave it alone. And, um, and I'm gonna go into that a little further, but that was my first evidence that something incredibly important was happening below the plants, below the flowers. And, uh, and then I in turn took a deep dive into that. This um, green sweat bee on my Areogonum rubescens, uh, these little flower heads, the specialized sort of relationship between the smaller bees and the smaller blossoms, also very powerful to me. And then learning about all the different butterflies that are actually lay their eggs and overwinter in the Areogonum because you're not sweeping it up, getting rid of it water for migratory and resident birds. Um, this yellow rumped warbler, uh, they come through, all the warblers come through California, the, the Pacific flyaway uh, in the spring and uh, water, this is an incredibly important thing to have. So uh, those are, we're starting to create a more uh, robust idea of what, what really habitat is and how it functions. And I'm just gonna keep going through and just do some animal stuff because what showed up in my photographs is kind of what started the Wild Yards project. I won't always have a story about it. I just think some of it's cool. Um, this is a longhorn bee. I just thought this palette was crazy, uh, beautiful. And also on a Cleveland sage, pound for pound here where I am in Northeast LA, I found Cleveland sage and the baccarus, the coyote brush to be two of the most powerful plants for pollinators uh, and also beautiful host plants. This is Coop. Coop learned to hunt in our yard uh, and would hang out. They let me get pretty close. Would just kind of hang out on the bird feeder after a failed run going for the um, house finches, but also left many a pile of feathers in our yard and still does, or at least a relative does. This is a wonderful annual spring phenomenon. So we have a parking strip that's mostly bare. We live, like as I showed you in a previous picture, right near a very busy urban street. So it gets a lot of foot traffic. People parking to get boba and go get cigars or go to the liquor store. But I plant Clarkia unguicolata there along that strip. And as the wildflowers grow in, the wildlife moves in. Um, a lot of alligator lizards and fence lizards migrate out to the, uh, to the parking strip. Um, this is a bush tit. The bush tits come through in a flock. They enter on the eastern, the northeastern corner of our property. They land in the toyon tree and then they slowly make their way with that, the sound of that, that little high pitch, almost like chime, like call that they have, working the new growth and removing all the predators. Um, so they're incredibly valuable. Uh, I have bird feeders out, but I would say very safely that 70% of the birds that come to my yard have no interest in the feeders. Wildlife attracts wildlife, birds attract birds. If you have a feeder and you maintain it well, what it does is send a signal to all the other birds passing by that there's something going on down there. So they will bring in a lot of birds that don't have anything to do with your, your feeders. Um, the warblers and the wrens and the towies and all these other things that are actually looking for stuff in your humus or you know, in your leaf litter. This was one of the coolest events uh, that I'd ever encountered. I'm sure many of you know what it is, but this is a group of male longhorn bees sleeping on the Cleveland sage. When I first saw this, I thought, I was like, oh, I killed them. Oh my God, like there's something toxic in my plant and I killed them. I called a friend of mine who's an entomologist and I sent him the picture and I said, what am I looking at? And he told me, of course, they're sleeping. He said, wait, go out in the morning when the sun hits them, as it hits them, they'll slowly take off. And that's what they do. Um, all this was riveting to me. Uh, I just became addicted to all the different animals and what they were doing and their rhythms uh, seasonally. This is a little guy who I haven't identified and I'm sure someone knows who it is on my hedge nettle. The hedge nettle flower is diminutive. Uh, little guy's really small, um, a beautiful bee, however, 
And these are uh, leaf cutters in the poppies who at a certain time of year kind of arrive on mass. Uh, if anyone is a bee specialist out there and can tell me more about this, it's very funny. Like there'll be one, one, one. And then at a certain time of year, uh, there's many in all the poppies. Little baby uh, native praying mantis eating a house fly. I'm really grateful for that on a tiny new um, pitcher sage leaf. And I love that also below that, which I didn't notice at the time, you can also see the spider web. I, uh, I hope that you get from these pictures that, you know, there's so much included in each of these events. There's so many factors in play that allow these events to occur. And uh, that's the part that for me is incredibly gratifying and really fills me with a sense of possibility. Um, another longhorn bee on the sage, just because I can't get enough of that. A bush katydid nymph on the uh, abutilon palmary. Uh, they love, love, love the, the new growth of the mallow and the black sage and kind of everything. And they'll kind of just hang out on it until they mature. But the psychedelic, the psychedelic crazy coloring of this creature uh, is a winner for me. And I love those long, funky antennas. A female carpenter bee on the Clarkia unguicolata that's out in the front garden. You know, that they, those, the, the, the Clarkia only bloom for a few months and then it's all just a parking strip again. But man, for those few months, um, that site is vibrant and alive. And I love watching these big girls come through. You can see all the, all the, uh, the Clarkia pollen back there. And uh, just, just an amazing creature. I love, love, love the carpenter bees. Uh, this is a family. I have a family of scrub jays that come through and just scream at each other. They just hang out and shout and steal peanuts and just, they just kind of complain. They just kind of show up and complain. They're, uh, they're kind of my favorites, uh, even though I, the only thing louder than them is these two. And I show you this picture because, uh, you know, uh, in Joan Nassar's uh, essay, Cues to Care, she describes the need for gardens to invite human participation. And I believe strongly in that. So I love a wild yard, but my yard is also for entertaining. It's for children. It's for animals. It wasn't necessarily for a dog, um, but, it, but it has turned out to be nonetheless. But it is a place for everybody to interact. And that's extremely important to me. I just want to do a quick thing about the biodiversity of the yard real quick. The Natural History Museum of Los, Los Angeles did a Bioscan biodiversity project. It's the biggest of its urban biodiversity study in the world. 80 sites, 1,872 samples, 500 plus species identified and counting, 47 new species discovered. One of the main things they got from this study, one of the many things they got from this study, was that gardens that used in the appropriate amount of water for the region and tended towards drought tolerant plants. Um, and many of those were largely just native plants had a 35, 30 to 50% more biodiverse, more biodiversity than the traditional water thirsty and some of the much more, the much bigger, more tropical um, gardens throughout Los Angeles. And I thought that was incredible. They did big Beverly Hills, like tropical themed, a lot of water far less biodiversity, which really drives home that plants and animals evolve together and the plant, the, and the, the, the biology of a site is based on how life occurred together on that site. So I thought that was cool. And one of the things they discovered was that uh, 30 new species of fly in Los Angeles, these little guys, and uh, I thought that was interesting and why you should give it shite about flies. About 6% of a hummingbird's diet consists of nectar, 6%. So everybody puts out hummingbird feeders, but the fact is 94% consists of those tiny flies. Those tiny flies breed in humus, in your compost, in your leaf litter. That's where they come from. So when you leave your compost, one of the many things it does 
is it provides a very rich and vital environment for all your microfauna. And that microfauna makes its way up the food chain in a very important way. This is a quote by my friend Barbara Eisenstein who wrote Wild Suburbia. And I just, uh, just bear with me, uh, I love it. Um, we're talking about native plants, native plants, native plants. And at one point when we were talking about, she goes, you know, can we not talk about native plants? And I said, why? And she goes, because all the native plants in the world aren't gonna give you habitat or do any good if you use them wrong. And, uh, you know, I thought that was, I thought that's at that point, at that stage of my development, I thought it was a sacral. I thought she was a witch. I thought she should be burned at the cross. And, uh, and she wrote me and she wrote this. She wrote a garden comprised of only or even mostly native plants will provide little food or shelter for birds or insects if it's maintained using today's most common garden practices. Removing leaf litter, woody debris, using blowers, applying herbicides and insecticides, heavily pruning trees and shrubs destroy habitat, regardless of plant provenance, plant selection. These common practices lead to a greater loss of biodiversity than plant provenance alone. And I say this because it's about biodiversity. I want to just plant that seed that that's what this is, idea is about. And then even when you talk about it in urban design, even when you talk about it, in, uh, the, the, the higher up we go in terms of how these ideas are applied, the more important it is to understand these ideas and, and, and hold to them. So gardening for biodiversity is gardening for humanity. This is my church garden that uh, I installed. I put my first plant in November 9th of, of 2019. So we'll be two next week. And uh, the power of native plants for amplifying habitat, it should be obvious by now. And clean running water for wildlife is essential regardless of region. But as development and climate change impact more and more fresh water sources, so providing that water is essential. But this is really about now who, say you don't care. Say you don't care about native bees, you don't care about butterflies or birds or any of that crap. Um, you know, what's a good argument for gardening for biodiversity? Well, I think uh, when, you, when you combine all the tenets, all the principles that we're talking about, um, it's wildly in our best interest. It's wildly in our best interest. So I'm going to dive into that now and try and unpack um, why gardening for biodiversity can have a powerful impact on the state of our world. Um, <clears throat> and I, 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 because I have a lot and I'm, I'm a little all over the place, um, I'm moving fast. Uh, if we, did anybody have any questions? Does anybody want me to like slow down and unpack something I've said or are we good to, to just move on? If no one says anything, then I'll, I'll just keep going. Five, four, three, two. You're doing great, great David. Okay, great, awesome. I think we're with, think we're with you. Okay, good. So leaf litter, is becomes humus. Humus is that relationship between your leaf litter and the ground beneath, and it all breaks down and creates this very powerful microbial series of ecosystems that then creates healthy mycorrhizae. The mycorrhizae is what talks to your trees. So leaf litter, which becomes humus, is the uh, in many ways it's the it's the it's the birthplace of that biodiversity which occurs from the surface down. And, and allows all those other relationships between the plants and the soil to occur, as well as all the insects and animals that rely on that to, to mate, to breed, and to feed. And that is a vast, vast, vast laundry list of creatures and uh, plants. So long-term deep soil carbon storage comes about through the creation of humus, the result of relationships between actively growing plants, fungi, soil microbes, and other critters in a matrix that includes mineral soil and organic matter. Leaf blowers destroy, kill off vital insects nesting, living in the leaf litter, and rob the soil of its capacity to sequester carbon. So this process, humification, builds topsoil while storing carbon in a stable form that stays put for hundreds of years. So not only is humus uh, incredibly important for our biodiversity, but it's a very, very powerful tool for sequestering carbon. And that's from the Ecological Landscape Alliance. That's their data. 
habitat plus water infiltration equals resilience. So I love this Aliso Park bioswale and native habitat. Using the ecosystem, using the water to feed the ecosystem and to sink the water in the ground, no matter where you live, but obviously in any urban environment, letting your water run into gutters and go out to the sea is insane. It's insane. And, and here in the Southwest, it's unforgivable. Um, so thinking about water infiltration by creating these garden systems is critical, I think, for our resilience long-term. A wild yard plus healthy maintenance practices equals a safer world. So lawns consume up to 10 billion gallons of water. We've been through this, 80 million pounds of pesticides, 90 million pounds of chemical fertilizers are responsible for five cents of our carbon emissions. Take that out of the equation. You've got 40 million yards doing that right now. The impact it has on our health is irrefutable. Increase in respiratory illnesses in children, increase in skin infections in children who play on their yards, issues with dogs and, and dog um, itchy. I think that's a technical term. Um, the, the damage we do uh, from taking care of our lawns is profound. And converting your garden back to a biodiverse garden that sequesters carbon, infiltrates water, and is healthier is, should just be a given. It blows my mind that we still have to fight for that, especially in parts of the world where we're seeing so much um, respiratory illness, a uh, heat island effect, all of these things. Oh, I like this one too. Uh, there, uh, over time, a native habitat garden costs approximately one third to one quarter the cost of a traditional turf lawn. Um, biodiversity plus humans equals sanity. So when I first started doing this, there wasn't a ton of data, but there's more and more data coming in daily that people who interact, live near and play in biodiverse ecosystems are just healthier. The rates of depression are lower and other kinds of illnesses. A study, uh, children who grew up in biodiverse ecosystems has, have less susceptibility to disease. And this is due to the microbial benefits provided by a biodiverse setting. Um, that comes from Microbiome uh, publishing in 26 of March, 2019. People who spend time in biodiverse settings have lower rates of anxiety and depression. Bio various studies conclude that interacting with complex natural ecosystems, not lawns and recreational equipment, complex natural ecosystems. I'm not talking about pinprick meat parks with to the best gyms equipment and like jungle gyms. That's not the same promotes better mental health. This is from Science Advances, Advances, which was published on the 24th of July. Another finding, which is not peer reviewed yet, is that biodiverse green space may have a tendency to reduce crime. As I said, still under peer review, but evidence is mounting that biodiverse green space reduces violent crime. <clears throat> yeah, was, when you're walking on a hike, why do you wanna punch someone in the nose? So, Biodiversity principles on the move. So taking it from, to me, the only way this can really matter is if we, if we begin to understand all these principles and how they can be used and adapted in a variety of settings that includes everybody. Because if this isn't for everybody, it's, it, then it's just, um, it's just a vanity project. <clears throat> uh, urban rooftop gardens, this is Alive Structures out of Brooklyn. And I feature them because we all know about rooftop gardens, but what I like about what they're doing is they're really focused on ser uh, serving the underserved and um, uh, neighborhoods that basically don't get access to green space. And they work with organizations like the Fortune Society and the HOPE program committed to environmental and economic justice. justice. So I love the idea of using you know, high-end um, homeowners in Manhattan to drive the business, but then use that to also create green space in urban areas where there isn't any. Um, food security. This is Duran Chavez. He's an activist and community gardener out of Richmond, Virginia. You should follow him on uh, Instagram if you don't. He's got several gardens that he's doing right now in uh, 
uh, in the Richmond area. They're amazing. He's a he's a beast. Um, but this is uh, this was at the Richmond. Um, this is called the Resiliency Garden at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Richmond. These are urban beds. This is all about uh, the inner city people living in food deserts. And this was a, in, this installation that he did. And then surrounding it, he surrounded it with all pollinator plants and native plants because 4,000 native bees in the world, uh, in the United States. I don't know how many in Virginia, but when you garden for edibles, if you circle that garden with native plants, you bring in a whole greater diversity of bees than just honeybees. And because they vary so much in size, they're able to pollinate more of the flowers. So you get better yield. And that was also proven uh, in a study that UC Davis did. School curriculums as urban green space. We have several amazing native gardens in really um, in the urban parts of Los Angeles. This is the Elise, uh, Leo Politi Elementary School. And um, this was a cool finding that they had. This is from an article in the Sonoran Joint Venture Bulletin. Less than two months after establishing a habitat, students at Leo Politi Elementary School began to see dozens of bird species flitting around the new plants in a 5,000 square foot space. As students began engaging with the habitat under the direction of their teachers and LA Audubon staff, test scores and proficiency scores in science rose along with new interest in birds, bugs, and flowers. And they found that even though obviously the great majority of kids did not then go into biology, this space functioned in a way that allowed them to interact with the natural world such that they had skills. And I, I can't hammer on this hard enough, is I have seen too many school projects where a bunch of well-meaning people come in on the weekend, they install plants, and then the kids come in and they just kind of run around and stomp on them. They don't have any meaningful relationship to those plants. But when children interact with the garden, and you can interact with it as an artist, you can interact with that as a musician, you can interact with it as a scientist or a mathematician, what they're actively doing is creating skills for taking on the issues facing them in a very real and present way. And I think this is by far one of the most important things that we can be doing is learning how to interact with the natural world that we create and understanding that we can create it and that everybody in almost every profession can have, there's an access to that and an interaction with that that can take us all to a much higher level of behaving in the future. Environmental justice, this is Janet Valenzuela, uh, ECR Communities for Environmental Justice as their organization. And uh, they work with people in the 710 corridor who are impacted by Superfund sites, a lot of toxins, uh, the big food desert down there. And she wrote me this quote that I just love, which is, the use of native plants in low income neighborhoods is a practical way to connect people to the outdoors and to the plants that once thrived in abundance here. Having native gardens, green space, and sacred places that liberate us from harm, environmental threats, which they are surrounded by, have a significant way of empowering the community residents in a built environment. It allows for radical imagination for them to see what our environments can look like beyond industry and beyond environmental degradation. She's not saying that everyone is going to become a gardener. What she's saying is that when you invoke these plants and you create, set up these relationships, those people suddenly are, are given a power that they are not given by their, their current environment. And I think we really need to hold on to those ideas. We really need to look those at and, and see how we can apply them no matter where we are or what we're doing. Uh, HOAs, this one was installed by Evan and uh, Tim over at Theodore Payne. Um, this is Marshall Villa's HOA. They were really skeptical at first, now they like it. There's another one doing it. This to me, HOAs to me is, a, is right now a challenge and it should be a slam dunk because these are highly efficient, easily maintained systems that once established don't cost a lot of money and um, that are healthier especially skewing towards older residents and things. People have a lot of uh, respiratory issues. Um, realtor workshops, we teach them. We teach realtors how to flip their property and create sites that are uh, much more compassionate toward the natural world and much lower in maintenance. 
China and the biodiversity mandate. Why does China have a biodiversity mandate? It's, it's not because the people at the top are big bug freaks. It's because it's smarter. It's more efficient. Sponge cities is one of the things that they're doing and they have, they have big water issues. So they're, they're basically creating swamps using native plants. They're just consider them like giant bioswales so that they can make sure they get all the water and put it in the ground. They have big issues with a lot of things, uh, but especially water over there. This is Lizao Forest City. And this is a development that pulls from the native ecosystem. This is obviously an artist rendering. If you look at the, if you go look it up, um, it's uh, Stefano Bori Archetti is the architectural firm. Um, this is what they're doing. And they're creating habitat to be built right within the building itself. They also provide key subsidies for forestry and ecological conservation projects. The list goes on and on. Um, you know, uh, if China can do it, we can do it. Although we're not an authoritarian government <clears throat> yet. Um, and Habitat Anywhere, I love this piece. This piece cracks your brain and fires your imagination, I think, perfectly. This is Anina Gerichik, and the project is called BirdLink. She builds these modular uh, structures. They can be scaled and they can be moved anyway. She creates a list of plant taxonomy. They're self-irrigated. And um, the idea is to attract bees and birds and pollinators and uh, you can put them anywhere. So she's put them all over Brooklyn, uh, all over Queens and different sites. And um, what I like about that is, uh, this is in a field because this is where she launched it. But uh, if you go online and you look at it, a lot of them are in courtyards or they're, you know, they're in places where people have no access, no experience, no interaction with complex natural ecosystems. And uh, this gives people that possibility. And I think, you know, ideas like this are very, very powerful. I, this is a cool seed of an idea. So this fragmented world that we were talking about where, you know, bees don't even have anywhere to go within 300 feet, much less, you know, six miles, or where a mountain lion can't get over into the Verdugo Hills, or a bobcat has a hard time getting from Debs Park up to the Arroyo Seco. This fragmented world can become reconnected. We have the capacity to do that. And I show this picture because this is the community garden. This is my day one, November 9th, uh, 2019. Uh, we put 350 plants in a dead lot at the corner of Eagle Rock and Addison Boulevard here in Eagle Rock. And I love this picture because this is a picture of a yucca. And what it's covered in is the, um, what they use to suffocate fires. Uh, my friend's nursery was up near one of the Ventura fires, and a lot of his plants were covered with that retardant. And uh, that is, uh, I think, a pretty good metaphor for what we're up against and what's going on, and yet what we can do. One year later, this is a Pensum and Spectabilis, and this is a native bee coming in to that beautiful blossom. Um, we have over 400 plants there in a 4,000 square foot area. And um, it's a lot of work. It's an urban garden. Uh, you know, we deal with all the same things that everyone deals with in an urban area, but it's biodiverse and it's very alive. And uh, so it's possible. I'm gonna just end the thought. I mean, this started with my kids as my kids hiking in the hill right over my house. And uh, Chief Seattle, it's a well-known quote, but I think it, you know, it never doesn't resonate. We have to teach our children. We have to teach kids that they have agency, uh, that the earth is our mother. Whatever befalls the earth, befalls sons of the earth. If men spit upon the ground, they spit upon themselves. This we know. The earth does not belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. This we know. All things are connected. Like the blood that unites one's family, all things are connected. <clears throat> what do we do? Inspiration, education, transformation, uh, photography and storytelling, do, uh, workshops and outreach. And we put plants in the ground, both uh, professionally and through my nonprofit. Uh, creating habitat where we live, working with schools and church groups, um, consultation one-on-one, -on -one, helping people 
uh, understand the possibility and agency they have with converting their property into habitat and then giving a roadmap for how to do it. And the Realtors program, also resources for Realtors. We give them an alternative to the plants they plant, a full guide that can be downloaded from our website. And that's it. Um, anybody who wants to help or be involved, just give me a shout. We have a lot of programs going on from the social media work to the actual site work. So <clears throat> we'll take what we can get. I'm done. I'll unshare. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um... I really enjoyed that a lot. I hate that you can't hear applause and see smiling faces. I right. will invite anybody right now who wants to um, put their camera back on. In, in, deaf culture, in deaf culture, they do this. They do that. And we have the digital applause too. So thank you so much. Um, I really, really, I don't, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I really appreciated your passion. It really came through. I think these are all really important messages. And so um, I don't need to dominate the conversation. There's already one question in the chat that we can get started with. And then anybody can feel free to um, like use the raise your hand function just to keep things orderly or just drop your question in the chat if you want me or Melissa to read it instead of um, unmuting and speaking. Um, but I'll, I'll start with Cindy's question since she dropped it in the chat. Um, do you have hints on how to talk to people about these habitat and pollinator gardens in our yards? I'm crazy about native bees, but not sure how to talk about it without sounding extreme um, or overwhelming people. <laughs> I've had a similar experience, Cindy, so. Yeah, well, I mean, plenty of people in my neighborhood think I'm crazy. So <laughs> I don't know, how, I mean, but you know, that people thought I was crazy before I did this. So I can't blame plants. Um, a lot of people have big fear of bees, you know, and it's very hard to get around that. Um, what I will say is what you already know is that I don't know anyone who's been stung by a native bee. I mean, wasps, uh, but very few native bees have any interest in stinging you because they're not, they don't have a giant colony to protect. Um, you know, it's not that they can't, although many of them can't, um, but it, because they're solitary, because they have a shorter lifespan and a shorter range, what they really are about is the business of, of, of you know, feeding and replicating the best they can with the limited means that they have. So they're pretty busy and they're not that interested in you. And yet, um, I think it's very important if people have the patience to, to really understand, and, I, and I, <laughs> there's a lot of bee people, there's a lot of people who raise bees, not it's fine, uh, but native bees are wildly misunderstood, both in the amount of pollinating that they do and how that impacts our um, agricultural trade and in how wildly underserved they are for habitat and, and, and food sources. So I think if you can get your hands around that in a calm way and, you know, and, and just ask people if they like to eat food, <laughs> See, ask them if they like food, and then narrow it down to like fruit and vegetables and, and let them know that that's a, that these things play an enormous role. And that if you plant native plants, um, you know, on, on, you know, honeybees are bullies, man, feral honeybees, whatever, they're, they're bullies, they're probably gonna show up. But when you plant a great variety of native plants, especially with the smaller blossoms and things like that, the, the little areogonums and the little pens, I mean, you're going to get native bees and you're going to get a lot less of, you know, all the just the honeybees that go to your lavender and that go to your, you know, your other more sort of commercial plants. Not strictly, but I mean, I do find over the season, especially like when, when all the, when all the, the summer bees are up and at it, they give the honeybees a pretty good um, run for their money. I don't know. And it's, and, and someone can write me on Wild Yards Project on Instagram and I'm happy to like, follow up on these conversations. Yeah. Yeah, we have we have a lot going on in the chat here. I don't know if you have the ability to open it, but a lot, um, a lot of compliments. Oh, Judith and, Smith, thank you. Judith Smith. Yeah, Smith, I was gonna great. read that, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I quoted Nick Hummingbird and I, and he's my partner on a lot of things, but I, uh, I, I didn't, uh, I didn't speak out to the original sort of caretakers and stewards of this land who got not and who were and still are all around here as well. Um, 
doing it way better than I do. Um, and I didn't, and I should, and I will. So thanks. I'm on Tongva land. Yes. So anyway, sorry, I was responding in the chat and also thank you for that. Um, if anybody else wants to chime in, has any questions or comments or thank yous for David, by all means, feel free to. Oh, Anthropore on hedge nettle. I'm writing that down. Please talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I love those little reminders. The light bulb goes on. You have to write it down right away. Is that, uh, is this sub person someone who, where'd that come from? Who was that? Anthropora on hedge nettle. Cindy. Cindy. Oh, yes. Yeah, that Cindy, was Cindy. Yeah. Same person with the bee question. She, Cindy, um, do you know a lot about bees? She does. Cindy, you can speak for yourself if you want to, but. Right, is it, you and I can email later because I have a bunch of bees that came today under my, on the Baccarus pillularis down in my school garden and I can't, can't tell what it was. Uh, I can, I need to send you a thank you card for this uh, talk anyhow. And we'll, we'll start talking back and forth. Um, Great. I'm brand new to bees, st still learning a lot, but you have some great resources down there and we'll link up. Yeah. Yeah, Cindy's, awesome. Cindy's one of our local, local uh, bee, bee experts. Um, and she lives, and yeah. she lives right down the street from me. And oh, awesome. <laughs> I only see the honeybees, but I don't know how she manages to see all the other ones. She, I, today I shot some video. I was going to try to get it in here, but um, I shot slow motion on the baccarus of honeybees, wasps, really tiny little black bees, flies, um, some really early, uh, almost like a longhorn summer bee, which I don't know what it was doing there, but it was cruising around. But I, I was able to get a bunch of slow motion footage of the bees. It, it's, yeah, it's the best thing ever. Yeah, David, I, just my compliments on your photographs. They're beautiful. I put oh, a thank little you. thing in the chat. They're really awesome. What can, What kind of a, do you use multiple cameras? Well, I mean, uh, unfortunately, a lot of times you just have your iPhone and you know, the iPhones right. are amazing. I have an iPhone 10 right now. One of these days I'll get a 13 because I demoed one at the Apple store the other day and I was like, dear God, <laughs> I mean, how does, I mean, it's incredible technology, but I use a Nikon D800. Uh, it's okay. a 35 megapixel camera and I use a Nikon uh, F28105 macro lens for that stuff. Um, and as anyone who's tried to shoot native bees before, it's, uh, it's so hard, they're so fast. They don't live as long, they're in a rush. That's, uh, that's what makes them such as stunning pollinators is they're moving fast. If you watch honeybees, honeybees move in this very kind of gentle melodic, but native bees like, gotta go, <laughs> like, you know, they're, they're in a rush. All right, we've got some additional questions here in the chat. Yeah. I was gonna jump in real quick, Melissa, and say yeah, two, go for two it. things about what's going in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. the quick one is someone suggested to check out BSIP on Instagram. We and are, just, and we're gonna get together. Yeah. I just looked it up and that, those are some amazing photos, but yeah. I don't wanna lose Heidi's question. Yeah. Because this is an important question that often um, is a barrier for people that would otherwise um, be inclined to uh, do habitat conversions. And her question is, what is a good source of finding out the native plants in different locations? So my first answer to that is I dropped a link there in the chat for Calscape. That's a website yeah, yeah. that CNPS manages and yep. it actually does a pretty good job of connecting you not only with um, good species for your region, but sources and nurseries that yep. um, that source native plants and also try to get connected with your local CNPS chapter and chat them up um, at meetings or I know it's harder when it's this format, but any in-person events that do take place in the coming year and plant sales and whatnot, you know, we're always happy to make recommendations um, and chat with you about what is appropriate locally. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Garden tours. Uh, the, the, Garden tours the, yeah. the whole reason that I even started this was <laughs> before I knew anything, I was like, we need an app. We need an app just like next door where everybody can join because the most important thing in my opinion is to go to the nearest person near you who's a little further down the road who lives in a similar similar location um 
and can kind of help you fine tune. But every site has its own challenges. And I would reverse it. And I would say that if you're just beginning, start really small, start small, pick a, pick a, I don't know, you know, whatever you have, if you have a deck, like take a couple kind of like Flora Ito at, uh, Theodore Payne, she does a really good course on container gardens. I'm sure you have someone up there. If you have a yard or, you know, any kind of, any dirt that's available, um, uh, then, uh, you know, do your homework, go to the Calscape, think about where you are, think about how much light it gets, think about what kind of soil you have. Those are, those are really easy tests to do. Uh, and then, you can go like, oh, a cowscape, you go like, oh, I have slow draining soil. It took, you know, eight hours for the hole to empty a 12 by 12 hole. And uh, it only gets sun for about four hours a day. So you go like part shade, slow draining, it, enter your area code, and it'll give you a list of plants that are happy in that area. But after that, it's trial and error. And I would say, don't be precious about it. Start small, don't be precious about it. I said this to someone today and they said, oh, you're a sociopath. I said, treat them like your baby, but don't worry if they die. Don't worry, plants I die. Like You're going like to kill that. plants. Don't, yeah, some are going to die. I've lost many in my own conversion, yeah. and it's always a little sad, yeah. but it's okay. They're yeah. telling you that they don't belong there or something was off. You could try that species again if you're really attached to it and see if it was just something weird the first time. Totally. But if yeah. it just doesn't work, you know, <clears> move on. <laughs> really like but that. yeah, that's it. I mean, start small and and do a little bit of homework. Try and find someone near you who's got a good reputation with their garden who has an established native garden, go talk to them and then put some plants in the ground. This is the time to do it. You know, yeah. I, when I, if I'm working a slightly bigger area, I do them in three different locations. And I also try and find a grouping. Like I'll do white sage, uh, moulin, moulin regans, you know, the deer grass and a black sage or, or a baccarus. And I'll, those seem to be nice together. So I'll do them in a couple spots, not in my yard because I couldn't fit deer grass anywhere in my yard, but um, things like that. So come up with a few plants that, you know, and at the, when you go to the calscape.org sort, when you site, when you click on a plant, it'll give you a list of companion plants. It'll say, these are nice together. They get along, they, they, you know, try that. Just do that. Go to, you know, pick a site. Once you realize how much sun you have, how, what your soil is like, pick a few plants, find out if they get along, put them in the ground, have fun. It's fun. Have fun. Have yeah. fun observing. Yeah. yeah. And learn how to plant and water them. So we had a recommendation um, for a book by Sharon Lovejoy, and I noticed that they were holding it up while you were talking. It's called Our Native Bees mm -hmm. by Paige Embry. Mm -hmm. um, that's in the chat for anybody who's interested in that. Um, there have been some more comments about um, Las Palitas, USDA, yep. all kinds of comments. Yep. Um, Tree, Tree of Life Nursery has amazing tutorials, online tutorials as well. Yeah. And um, there's some questions about what are your greatest challenges in converting to a native garden? <laughs> <laughs> in the physical process of it or in the I imagine so. <laughs> Mindy, do you want to? Mindy, where are you, Mindy? What well, were some of your greatest challenges? Hi, sorry. No, I have. Uh, I, I bought into a house that has uh, mostly hardscaping, and I have to convert it. And uh, I'm just interested in in you know some things are really challenging to convert and expensive. <laughs> so oh yeah. Interested in hearing you know how other people have tackled challenging situations. Give me a specific. Give me a specific. Like what? Give, like. Tell us get one thing that being a <laughs> okay. So I I, I, was, I I moved here from Oregon and things grew so easily. There was all this water and it yeah. was easy to convert my yard yeah. there. Yeah, <laughs> that's why we're all crazy here. Yeah, but yeah, and but is that what are you talking about? Just like the because the watering regime. Uh, it's funny. I, I will install a garden for someone and I'll give them a watering regime, and they won't do it. Um, people can go on autopilot with watering, which is really funny. And they'll just, I don't know, they'll throw like a bucket of dishwater on it every day. I mean, people do crazy stuff. I mean, someone literally was telling me that they just throw their dishwater from their pasta on the plants. Like, 
three nights a week. And I was like, I, I don't know what to tell you. I can't believe anything live, um, which is a testament to the ten tenacity of California native plants. But um, getting a watering regime, for, first of all, planting in the right place at the right time. Right. Um, and then, you know, there's a, I shouldn't do this right now, but I'm gonna. Um, have you gotten really into like how to plant them or are you just sort of winging it? Oh, no, I, it's, I'm personally just chased with, uh, faced with the challenge of converting the hardscaping to um, soil. <laughs> That's the right. Oh, so you're the actual process of trying to get your soil plantable. There's no soil yet. Right. I mean, I'm, right. I'm converting some of it, but yeah. So you're, you're actually ripping up concrete? It's, it's, it's four inches of DG. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's 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 like might yeah. as well be concrete. That's right. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and so it's going to take you a little while. I mean, the good news is that native plants, the, the, the California chaparral plants are tough. They don't need a lot of nutrients, yeah. but obviously soil that's been compacted like that. Um, you might want to. I don't do a lot of amendments when I do gardens. I, I think it's really important for the plants to find their way. But a lot of people do. And they're usually people who know more than me. Um, so, uh, you know, once you get the DG up, um, there's different things that you can do. I I'm not a big fan of like, you know, um, uh, putting different minerals and chemicals on it. I mean, I, it'll come back in time and, and some, and you can look at some of the successional plants, plants that just don't need much like baccarus and things like that. Like they're just warriors. And they'll start to actually amend your soil for you. That's a good tip. Thanks. Yeah. So you might want to look at the successional plants yeah. for your region and get those into the ground first. Thanks. Yeah. And, you know, get some, I mean, you, eventually you want them to make their own mulch, but, um, you know, you get some, get some compost around them, not too close to the, to this, you know, to the root ball or the stem because you can get pathogens and things they don't like. Keep it about out under the drip line, about five or so inches away from the stem and you know, water that mulch and let the mulch really start to break down and, and uh, vivify your soil. Thanks. Or don't, <laughs> Look, don't let me boss you around. No, no, I, I, I was really just, I just love hearing how other people have tackled different challenges. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of people learning. on here. I'm sure there's a lot of people listening who know a ton and will send you all kinds of <laughs> this compact <laughs> soil. Look, I, I have a parking strip and my church was, that was all, it was junk. It was a, very hard to get, but here's an interesting thing. We just did a uh, sidewalk got ripped up at the church, took it, I mean, at our school, it took me, it took me an hour and a half to get a hole for a 15 gallon toy on into the ground. It was like carving cement. And I thought this poor thing's never gonna live. It's just never gonna live. And uh, COVID hit, the school was closed down. We didn't go in. I went back uh, a couple, obviously, when the kids started school this year, and it's eight feet tall. So, you know, if you pick the right plants, you'll be surprised. They, they can hack through anything. I mean, I went down to Walker Canyon, and, uh, you know, when there, there was that big super bloom happening two years ago, and I took a picture of all the California poppies and Encelia and the Chia Sage. And then the, the slope had dropped away and it was just DG, it was just junk. And all of that beauty, all of those plants are living right on top of it. So you'd be surprised. Just um, try and when, whatever nursery you go to, just ask them what are the, you know, probably like soldago or um, gum plant or, you know, a bunch of those and the baccarus, the coyote uh, brush, those things, will, they're pretty tough. You'd be surprised. Um, there was a long question in here. I'm not sure if it got answered from Aaron, Aaron Jakubenko. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, about birds preferring native fruits and seeds. And he's asking, how do you battle? How is your battle with a yard of edibles going amongst uh -huh. a thriving yard? Aaron! <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um... <laughs> I'm not having a battle uh, at the moment because we got a dog and uh, nothing will dare come into the yard. 
Um, but we did have a lot of rats. We did have a lot of mice. They had a lot of things. I built a hugel culture, as Aaron knows. And so we had a lot of vegetables and things. And, you know, it's, if, you, if you grow food, you're, it's not just for you. Um, uh, but fruit especially tends to just get a lot of visitors. And I think it's part of it. Um, uh, I, I don't mind a couple rats. Uh, when I can see two or three at once, I know I've got a giant issue. And then it's time to start, um, let's just be honest, killing rats. And uh, so I've, I've killed one or two rats in my day. I would put a zero on the end of that, maybe two zeros. Um, but that's about it. But I mean, I, anytime you have plants, I mean, there's just certain things you have to do to keep, you know, maintain sort of healthy practices with them. But it's food, man. It's a city. You're right in the middle of it. True, is true. That, is that it? Is that in the ballpark of an answer, Aaron? No, that is. That's that's beautiful. That's just something I've been thinking about this week. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. Beautiful, David. Thanks so much. That was really wonderful. Oh, man. It's great to see you. Yeah, you too. I had a plant. Oh, and I actually, I will say, I so I've just ripped up, David knows, a backyard full of concrete. A lot of concrete. and Shoot, like a basketball court of concrete. And my back is paying the price. But I did a course at um, White Buffalo Land Trust all about composting. And their suggestion was turn big mounds of compost in the areas where I'll be planting. So that's what I'm going to start about sort of eight weeks out from planting stage. Um. That, uh, that's interesting to me. You want to be careful, though, because too much nitrogen for some of your natives, it'll kill them. Uh, they don't like too much nitrogen. So depending upon who, where are they based out of? They're way down the coast, but that's a good point. This is actually yeah. where I'm doing the orchard section. I'm doing it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, a lot of times the permaculture people will, will ask you, to, you know, if the people who are doing sort of regenerative work and permaculture work, they'll make those suggestions. I you got to be careful with the native plants indigenous to our region because they don't like all that nitrogen. But, um, but yeah, I mean, and turning it, and as someone wrote here, removing that first, Caitlin uh, Burleson recommended just removing that top compacted layer. Um, I mean, that should do it. I, remove it or break it up. The only thing you're also going to find when you break up that compacted soil is it becomes, um, in disturbed soil is always, you're also going to get your, your invasives. Um, not all, but you know, so that's just something you got to deal with. Um, you know, that's it's don't put down weed cloth or anything like that. Don't do anything like that. Just trust the process. Keep coming back. The program works. Okay. It, it looks like the chat's kind of slowing down. Is there anyone else out there who feels like their question hasn't yet been answered? Um, I want to thank you, David. I, I, your presentation was awesome. Um, I want to thank you for all of us at the San Luis Obispo chapter for helping us out and for being here tonight. And um, it was it was just great. So thank you very much. And thank you. I'm, respond, I'm responding to Cat Rogers real quick. So I'm, I'm okay. seem like a, dog, a distracted dog. That's what I'm doing. Oh, no problem. Yes. Oh, we got another question. What do you do for Hillside? <laughs> That's what I'm responding to. All right. I it's didn't a big, want to it's a big conversation. I'm, do, I'm doing three of them right now. I'm doing some pretty big ones and there, okay. there's an approach to it, I think. And I'm, I, I don't want to bog everyone down with it, but I'm happy to respond to that later. Yeah, and you know, I'll just plug really quick for, uh, for David at Wild Yards Project on Instagram. Um, his social media is very informative. Um, might be a good way to get in touch with any follow-ups. Uh, yep. I don't want to flood your inbox, David, but um, this has been such a good conversation and I hope it was really helpful for some people. Um, just some of the practical implementation stuff and maybe some of the excitement to, to, to go for it, right? To get some natives. In yeah, don't support. overthink it. Don't overthink it. Just, just go and have conversations with someone at a nursery. Use the Calscape. To get some ideas, jot them down, go to a nursery, pick a few plants in a small area and, you know, see what happens. Yeah. And Cindy pointed out one more event that is just worth plugging really quick. Our chapter is having a work day at the local Napomo Native Gardens. So check our newsletter, which is posted to our website. If you're interested in participating, it could be a great opportunity to chat with 
people who have info and just ask questions in person. So um, anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for sharing thank your you. excitement, all your lessons learned and your inspiration. Much appreciated. Likewise, really appreciate it. And thank you for all the participation and questions. Don't yes. be afraid to follow up and ask questions. It's, it's this wild yards project. It's not about my yard, it's about yours. So yes. it's all about the questions. All right, David, See thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>